In this video, I'm going to teach you a quick and easy framework that you can use to categorize the top investment banks in the world. Now, as you can expect, most people are concerned with working at the best investment bank that they can. They want to work at a firm that will improve their career and give them lots of exit opportunities. But I think depending on the constraints that you have in your own career, whether that's a particular geography you want to work in or a particular industry, the key people that are actually identified as the best firms might differ. For example, if you want to work in a specific industry like healthcare or technology, or if you want to move back home and then work in a specific geography, then there's not always going to be every investment bank available. And investment banks are essentially financial advisors that advise companies on corporate finance decisions and financial transactions. So that can entail actually quite a few different things. Investment banks can help companies IPO if they're a private company. They can help them do M&A if they want to acquire another business. They can also help them sell their business in a sell-side transaction. They'll also do things like help your business raise debt or have equity research cover your company. They're essentially there to help you with all matters related to corporate finance. So with that being said, when looking at the investment banking landscape, I would generally boil it down to four categories. And then within those categories, you kind of get there from two axes. So first we have characteristics of business model. Broadly speaking, in investment banking, there's two major kinds of businesses. There are these businesses that have balance sheets and as such can help you raise financing more easily. They can take on their own underwriting risk when they are doing deals. And that's companies like Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, at sort of the middle market level, you might have Jefferies and RBC. Relatedly, you'll find that a lot of these bulge bracket firms actually deal a lot with other parts of the business as well. Oftentimes, they'll also have divisions devoted to personal wealth management, equity research, sales and trading, and more. So on one side, we have these bulge brackets that kind of offer everything under the sun. So if you're in the investment banking division at one of these bulge brackets, you might theoretically be exposed to a broader range of deals. You might do an IPO or a certain kind of financing and then an M&A and deal with many different parts of the business. These bulge brackets also tend to have the longest history and often the largest geographical breadth. So these companies will have presences in different continents and oftentimes it helps them work on more complex deals. So under this category, we have what is known as middle market investment banks. And the main difference between bulge brackets and middle market investment banks is honestly really scale. For example, if these middle market firms continue to grow over time, there's no reason why they wouldn't be considered a bulge bracket. And conversely, if the lower performing bulge brackets continue to perform lowly, sometimes they won't be considered a bulge bracket anymore. Now, there's no really strict definition of what constitutes the middle market, and it might depend on where you are in the world. As a rough kind of heuristic, I often think about it as sub $1 billion enterprise value companies, and you'll see that the average deal size for the bulge brackets tends to be well north of this, while some of these middle market companies, a lot of the times they're dealing with smaller businesses. Some notable mid-market firms include places like RBC, Macquarie, as well as HSBC. And you'll often see a trend that a lot of these firms tend to be dominant in one geography like RBC in Canada or Macquarie in Australia. But then on the global scale, they're still treated much more like middle market firms. Again, something that can change over time. So that's one side of the chart. These are firms that again have balance sheets. On the other side, we have investment banks without balance sheets. And the big category here is known as elite boutiques, often self-described as independent advisors. The primary difference here is that elite boutiques do not have balance sheets. That means they focus more on pure financial advisory, oftentimes on M&A transactions. Many elite boutiques internally will actually refer to themselves as independent advisors. The main reason here is that they're independent and they don't have competing interests. One of the main complaints that you'll hear about bulge brackets is because they have so many different divisions, they often compete for different incentives. From a career perspective, you'll find if you're at an elite boutique, you'll primarily be doing M&A or maybe restructuring, but you won't get very much exposure to IPOs and financings, which can be a hindrance on your overall skill set. But many people still choose to go to elite boutiques for a couple of reasons. I think the big one is that they tend to pay more. At the junior level, it might only be a difference of maybe 10 to 20%. But as you scale up, you'll see that elite boutiques really do pay a larger percentage of the deal profits to the deal team and the investment bankers themselves. It's a classic comparison of bureaucracy. These larger investment banks often have many different divisions and lots of big offices. While the comparison is often that elite boutiques can focus on just doing deals, focus on doing investment banking and executing on high quality advice. Some top elite boutiques include places like Evercore, Centerview and PJT. 
Now, the fourth category of investment bank is regional boutiques. So again, if you want to work in a very specific geography, there might only be a couple of quality investment banks in your area. And as such, the best place to work is actually one of these regional boutiques. And honestly, the only real difference between this category and elite boutiques, again, is scale. Most of the time, these regional boutiques will be focused on a specific geography or only be working on kind of these middle market or smaller deals. Again, that doesn't make them a worse place to work. Many of the times, you're actually getting more autonomy and more responsibility at a relatively smaller firm. These regional boutiques generally won't have a balance sheet as well, so they're also just focused on M&A restructuring and other corporate finance advice. I would say from a career perspective, as I've gotten older, I've seen more people actually gravitate towards regional boutiques, but oftentimes you can also get a little bit more of a title bump because these smaller firms tend to incentivize larger players to join their firm by giving them good titles and potentially more economics. So this was actually a pretty neat categorization of the world of investment banking. In reality, you'll actually find a lot of different kinds of businesses that sometimes only offer a specific function that an investment bank might. For example, merchant banks and corporate banks might be involved in some of the lending or can help with the IPO, but might not be able to advise on things like M&A. So the actual list of competitors and the mosaic of finance as a whole might really depend on where you are in the industry. If you're interested in learning more about the technical side of things, you should check out some of our great courses online at peakframeworks.com, where we teach things like valuation, how to build your own resume, and private equity modeling. Thank you for watching this video, and I will see you in the next one.